If you were a young single man graduating high school or college between 1964 and 1973, you were faced with the knowledge that Uncle Sam was coming for you. Sooner or later, a draft notice would show up with your name on it, detailing where and when you should report. Most young men had few options when it came to the draft. Boys who were of the working class were more likely to be sent to the front lines. This occurred for several reasons, including that college students were allowed draft deferments. For many young men, the only real choice they had was to enlist rather than wait for the draft. This allowed them the option of choosing a particular branch of service or specific job training. For those who did get deferments, those were college students, married men with dependents, or men who took on jobs that were deemed necessary at home, jobs like teachers or scientists. Most young men had little other options though, and when their number came up, they were gone. I come home one night, I wasn't, I, you know, everybody's getting drafted. <laughs> I come home one night and uh, she had roast beef dinner, and I love roast beef. And she had a long face, and she said, there's a letter on the counter there for you. <laughs> it was Uncle Sam, you know, greetings from Uncle Sam. I was in, uh, in the uh, degree program for engineering. And we had a laboratory situation, and in there was uh, uh, Don, I can't remember his last name right now, but he was, he was a um, reserve CB, and he knew that, that we had low uh, draft numbers at the time. He knew that we were going to be drafted as soon as we graduated from ECC. If you went to college, you, you, you got a deferment. And uh, I did go to school for one year. And I ended up going part-time to Bonaventure to make up a few grades, and I was drafted out of it. If you were drafted, you went in the, usually you went in the Army. So that's why I enlisted, volunteered, and enlisted in the, in the Air Force. The, the thing that was given to us was the idea that communism was uh, a, a problem throughout the world. If we didn't do something to stop it, then um, we, we could possibly uh, have to deal with it here on our own land. You know, we spent every Saturday afternoon watching, you know, double features at, at, at the theaters down in Olean, and, and they were all war movies, so we were, you know, we were pumped all our life for that. You know, nobody knew too much about Vietnam, you know, because it was really just ramping up. Well, you had to register with the Postal Service when you were 18. Mm -hmm. uh, how they picked your name, then there was no lottery when I got drafted. A lottery system that was randomly drawn by birth dates. And uh, so you got uh, 365 days a year and months, 12 months. And they were on a, on a ball, I think, in, in some place in Washington, D.C. And they randomly just started picking, picking numbers from 1 to 365. Any number that was approaching um, uh, less than uh, 100, I think, your, your odds of going to Vietnam were pretty darn good back then. There were only two options if you were drafted. Go to Canada or go to jail. Go Canada was the big thing. You know, go to Canada. I just, I never even considered it. Yeah, yeah I know. In fact, uh, there's still some around here that went to Canada. The rural kids that I knew uh, you know, all of the virtues that they, they held and, and, and goodness for the country, um, all that was kind of gelled at the time. What would I tell my kids? You know, what did you do in the war, Dad? Well, you know, I went to jail for four months. Went, went, you know, I went to Canada and snuck. No, I, that, I never considered that. I was scared. It just wasn't our, our nature to run. You know, if the country needed you, then you went and did what you had to do for your country, and that's what I did. America's involvement in Vietnam and the resulting divide it created among America's youth was the result of these different experiences. The men who served came home to men who did not. The war that dragged on showed itself to be unwinnable, and the political landscape turned against the government as the daily horrors of war were transmitted into American homes on their evening news. There were two worldviews, one where you fought in these horrors and one where you fought against these horrors. 
Like what often happens, we forget the perspective of the other. The men at home sometimes forgot that those who were in Vietnam didn't have a choice in the matter. Our soldiers arrived in Vietnam to find a land of beautiful landscapes, rolling hills and jungles inhabited by people that lived off the land as farmers. This fertile area with an average temperature of 84 degrees, 100% humidity, and an average rainfall of 24 inches was in some ways very similar, but also foreign to our four from Cattaraugus County. The Vietnam War was a civil war between communist North Vietnam and democratic South Vietnam. The two countries were officially divided at the 17th parallel of latitude, which was also known as the DMZ, or Demilitarized Zone. The mission our military was given was to unify Vietnam into one democratic country because of the fear of the domino theory. This theory held that if one country fell to communism, others around it would follow. The main objective of the United States was to prevent not only South Vietnam from becoming communist, but the other Southeast Asian countries, such as Laos, Cambodia, and Thailand, from becoming communist as well. It is a kind of a pretty country, you know, they have all the Buddha temples and stuff splattered all over the hills. Actually, my first tour was November to December, and it wasn't too bad, but it was it was so hot. I couldn't get over how hot and muggy it was at that time of year, you know. And as it got closer to summer, it was even more hot and more more muggy. I'm, a, I'm always telling my wife or kids or grandkids, you know, on a hot day around here, it's not Vietnam. There is a monsoon season where it rains constantly and dry socks were a godsend. My mother would send me dry socks because your feet were always wet. During the rainy season over there, if you wanted water, all you had to do was stamp your foot on the ground two or three times and it would come right up out of through the sand. Where the, the villages had, had um, thatched roofs um, the people had no plumbing, the uh, electricity was uh, negligible wherever you went. Uh, you couldn't travel over 30 miles an hour because the roads were so bad. When I was in the field, in the area that I had just described, was one step up from caveman. They had a hut with a thatched roof, Lucky if they had a wall, hard clay floor, and an urn in the corner boiling something. That was it. We did have uh, uh, Vietnamese working on our base uh, in our areas and stuff like that, but they had all been supposedly vetted and checked out and all this other stuff and couldn't talk to them very well because of the language barrier. You know, I didn't understand their customs and they didn't understand ours. and. We really didn't care as long as they did their work and stuff and we got along with them, you know, it was fine. Uh, it was a constant changing crew because, you know, if Charlie would hit us one night, usually one, one of your crew or two were missing the next day. So you knew, you know, that they were Viet Cong. They were just people that, that just like me, that lived in their house in the daytime and and at nighttime, they would just get together and go out and, and do their ambushes or whatever they were going to do. At VA, where the military soldiers, uh, you know, trained at, a, at one of their military camps, somewhat like I was. France fought nine years over there. 
Nine years, same as us. They kicked France out, and then the North Vietnamese was, was probably the finest infantry in the world at the time. To really honestly be in pitch dark, knowing that 50 feet away is somebody who wants to cut your throat, take your tongue out, shove it up your ass, is a whole different ballgame. And, um, and uh, you, cannot, you cannot even put words to the, to the fear that you have, not knowing what's going to happen in, within the next 30 seconds. Uh, it's, it's just, um, it, it bothers me to this day. Uh, some, some, of the, some of that. As President Lyndon Johnson explained when he increased our involvement in Vietnam's Civil War, why must young Americans born into a land exultant with hope and with golden promise toil and suffer and sometimes die in such a remote and distant place? To send the flower of our youth, our finest young men, into battle? How their mothers weep and how their families sorrow. He explained that America had no choice because North Vietnam and Communist China who sought, in his words, to conquer the South, to defeat American power, and to extend the Asiatic domination of communism, an Asia so threatened by communist domination would certainly imperil the security of the United States itself. In 1945, returning World War II vets were greeted as heroes across the United States. They were recognized for their sacrifices and parades were held in their honor. For Vietnam vets, it was an entirely different story. Soldiers returning from Vietnam came back to a divided country, one where they received little thought or concern. Their sacrifices and the unspeakable horrors that these soldiers endured were often forgotten by Americans. Some Americans even place blame on the returning vets rather than the U.S. government for our involvement in Vietnam. Many of our vets were left feeling socially and emotionally isolated as a result. You know, people start, well, you're spending all this money on war. Why don't you spend money on helping the people here? You know, which is a good thing. But, you know, you got people over there sacrificing their lives and stuff to keep this country like it is now, you know. And yet you got other people that, no, bring them everybody home. We all love coming home, but it, it, it was coming home was like, we were a little skeptical because it seemed so crazy back here. My father was a Buffalo policeman and he was, he was involved with the protests at UB and all around, but he never told me about this stuff. It's, it started when I was in basic training and, and AIT when uh, um, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy got shot. And they said, be ready, we might have to go, you know, you know, try to make the streets of America safe. On the plane and that, you weren't, you weren't liked that much. If they knew, you know, that if I come back with the anything indicating Vietnam on my uniform, a lot of people frowned on that. There was a, a Green Beret guy who was on a plane with me. He has his Green Beret and his greens and his medals and the whole deal. And we're walking through the airport and that's the first time I heard it. I heard baby killer. Uh, he even got spit on. And I'm thinking, you friggin' people don't have any clue what this guy w just went through for you. When I got home, I was never called a baby killer or anything like that. But it was, I was, what I was amazed about was the people who could have cared less. It, it was curious because I remember friends coming up 
up to me and saying, where you been? <laughs> They're like, I drank a lot, you know, it just, I got alcohol poisoning one time because I drank so much. And I had to go to the doctor and he said, you know, you ought to really quit drinking and stuff. And For a while I was obviously sleepless nights, you know, things that you would wake up and think about or would happen to you. I really didn't want to be around people. And that's not like me to, I mean, I talk a lot. But uh, uh, I think a lot of guys, when they come back, they want to be around crowds. You know, for some reason, you want your space. When they got home, they were still scared. You know, they were still having images of being in a battle. Uh, took, a, took advantage of the GI Bill. Um, um, you know, wanted to start a career. I had this 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 house in in my mind. Um, you know, there's a lot to do. Uh, you know, that whole Vietnam thing was just like it was it was it was there, and I didn't really want to deal with it at the time. You know, so it was easy to get rid of for the time being. Oftentimes, the stories of returning veterans being spit on or as targets of protesters were retold in the press, causing returning veterans to feel increasing resentment toward the anti-war movement. Regardless of whether or not the soldiers experienced this type of reception upon their return, the fact of the matter was that it had an emotional impact on them, and it often shaped how they dealt with their experiences once they got home. Now in retirement, our veterans often find themselves reliving their experiences repeatedly. They question the role they played and the impact the war had on their lives. Their personal views on the conflict vary widely, but the effect the Vietnam War had on their mental health is undeniable. In fact, today, many Vietnam veterans suffer from a variety of mental health issues, such as anxiety, depression, and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, a mental health condition that develops after experiencing or witnessing a life-threatening event like combat. I probably growed up a little bit over there, you know. Our commander would say, all right, I want you to do this, and you know, it's up to you to decide how you want to do it. So, you know, I was pretty much on my own, and I'm the one that had to make decisions. I sit on this porch at night and he's still thinking about stuff that, well, that's any soldier. You know, anybody that was in that type of situation, you're gonna, you're gonna be that way. You know, it's never gonna leave you. You saw things that were terrible, horrible, and you were part of it, you know, and that hurt. Uh, and you think back at those things and you don't forget them. Well, I think we still did the right thing being over there. I wish the, they'd let the military run, run it and things would have been different. I don't think we'd have lost as many people. There's a lot of us that came back and had questions. And we had questions, why? What's going on here? What's the deal with, the, with, the, with the Washington and wanting to do certain things that were to their advantage and not so much our advantage? I didn't want to believe <laughs> that they didn't want to win this. It was other reasons for it, uh, but down the road now I can see where I have no idea what the objective was there uh, because it surely wasn't accomplished. We got our butts kicked, we ran, you know, for what? We got nowhere. If, if, if it had happened now, same thing, I wish I had the courage 
not to go. Why? Why? Yeah. It was totally wrong. The war was totally wrong. They wanted to be a free country. And we told them to go to hell. They just fighting for independence. That's, that's all they wanted. We went to Baghdad. The military, which was like 1990, something like that. Uh, they were talking about bringing the draft back. And I wrote a letter to my congressman I volunteered because I said, take me, not my boys, you know, because <laughs> I've been there, you know, and I don't want my boys going through that. You have to, you have to be able to <clears throat> ask the right questions. You have to ha be able to have response to your question. You have to be able to debate what, what is true. You have to have people on the other side who want to debate what is true. Then you have to work together, not separately, to um, correct any problems that you may have or any any dissension that you have. It can't be one-sided. This American, this, this America that we have and love today, will not will not work unless it's worked together, both sides working together. As a 12-year-old that was caught in the crossfire, and. Uh, he was dead. And what I got out of that was, it, it seemed like, and this came later, is that kind of summed up the war to me. You know, American soldier, wounded, went home, NVA, got away. And a civilian, 10, year, 10 or 12 year old kid, was killed. It didn't matter if he was a capitalist, Democrat, Republican, whatever, communist, it'd be better to be alive than dead. Mental health services are essential in order to help our returning vets recover from their combat experiences and mental health issues related to their military service. There are a number of troubling statistics that show that many of our veterans are still not receiving the care that they deserve in this area. This lack of care can lead to substance abuse issues, depression, and suicide. The Veterans Administration reports that approximately 22 veterans die by suicide every day and that over 50% of all veteran suicides happen between the ages of 63 and 75. Thank you.